Good afternoon, everybody. And I so nearly said good morning because I'm so used to uh, <laughs> saying good morning. Um, how lovely to see you all. Uh, we've got a really jam-packed uh, session today and we've got a lot of people that are joining. We've had uh, over 1,100 people sign up for this webinar, which is amazing. Uh, my name is James Sunbrook. Um, I'm chuffed that you can be here. Um, in the chat function, before we get going, make sure you uh, click on the little blue button at the bottom that says host and panelists and change it to everyone and then that way uh, people will be able to see the, the comments that you're uh, that you're putting in there. Um, it's a glorious day outside as people are already saying which is lovely. I feel a bunch of positivity and so let's let's carry up, carry that through into the session. Um, also if you're new uh, say hi. Uh, as I say we've got loads of new people potentially joining today and we're all marketers here looking to, uh, to make a good session. Um, and our session is with none other than Perla Virgi, who is a fabulous human being who has amazing energy. Uh, she's spoken for us before, which is why we've got her back because she was so good the first time. Um, she is the author of uh, High Impact Content Marketing, which we'll come on to later, uh, Principal Consultant at LinkedIn, ex Microsoft, international keynote speaker, coach, trainer. She's been there, she's done it. Um, and when I spoke to Elle, who is our head of events earlier, and I said, oh, we've we've got uh, we've got Perna on. She was like, ah, oh, she's wicked, which I think is exactly the line we're going to go with today. Uh, Perna is wicked. She's based in Philadelphia. And coincidentally, she's going to be emceeing our first marketing meetup Philadelphia event. Woohoo! And at that event next Thursday, we've got Ran Fishkin speaking. So, like, I mean, we've got it. We've got it all right. Um. So today is going to be a presentation uh, and then a Q and A in our in our normal sort of fashion. Um, so make sure that you keep the chat alive uh, on the right hand side, and then when you've got questions, put your questions into the Q and A. Uh, and if you like a question that's in there, click the thumb to upvote those, and we'll try and answer those first. Now you may have noticed uh, in the sort of pre webinar email that I included a link to our friends uh, at Clavio. Uh, who are hosting an event. For those that don't know how the Marketing Meetup works, we have partners that invest in us uh, so that we can keep these events free for you. And Clavio have been a big part of the community this year and they've helped us become better marketers and to connect with each other uh, with things like their e-commerce day that we, we held with them. Um, but not only that, they sometimes put on their own events and they've got one on the 6th of December that I am 100% going to. Uh, it's with Rory Sutherland. Uh, who we've had talked for us before. He is both incredible and ridiculously energetic. Um, and on the event description, it says, get inspired by seeing how small changes can lead to incredible results if you're brave enough to try. Now, knowing the folks at Clavio uh, and what a performer Rory is, uh, I know that's going to be an amazing event. So I'll send the link out again afterwards um, and uh, go check that out. But also, a big thank you uh, to our other sponsors. So we've got Braze, Storyblock, Impression, Exclaimer, Cambridge Marketing College and Redgate Software. Uh, please do go and show your appreciation to our partners uh, because they're why we're here and why it's all free for you. So uh, see so yeah, a huge thanks to them. Um, that's me done. You're here for Perna uh, and the magic she's going to bring to the session. So um, as I say, Perna's going to go through a presentation and then uh, if you get your questions in throughout, and then we'll uh, we'll have a chat with her after that. Cool. So, Perna, over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited to be back. Hang on. Let me pull up the chat so I can see all your lovely messages. This is the best community on the planet. And how super, super lucky am I to be a part of it again today? I have, This is all I've been looking forward to. So I'm sorry for all of the gushing. To stop the gushing, let's start with a question in the chat. Now, tell me how many times, and just guess the number, how many times do you think people wear an item of clothing before they chuck it? Okay, three, seven, ten, nine. Okay, three, twenty, fifty. Ooh, they're really all over the map, aren't they? Awesome. Okay, I'm seeing... Um, a whole bunch. Okay, 115, three. We're varying degrees right here, right? 
<laughs> well, there was an official study. It was by the British charity Bernardo's, and they found that a piece of clothing gets worn an average of seven times before being discarded. And this was in 2015, before the rise of Instagram and the extra rise of all of these cool fast fashion brands. But we're not here to talk about fashion, right? We're here to talk about content. Look, the big question is, are we guilty of treating our content like we do with fast fashion clothing, which is just created with speed and cost in mind, rather than long lasting quality, and hence it's only used once or twice before discarding. And what's that doing? If we're treating our content more like a Shein clothing versus a Chanel clothing item, we just tend to create more work on ourselves because we're constantly having to create more and more content and then it goes unread. Success though comes from identifying those big ideas and working your assets off. Less Shein, more Chanel. Now you might think that, oh, you know, does that just mean I need to wear the same clothing everywhere? Like if I have a Chanel purse, is that the only purse that I can take with me everywhere? That's not what I mean. And that's not even the most effective things that you can do. Um, instead, what I'm going to tell you is to take the same concept, one idea or like one piece of clothing and make it feel very fresh, unique, different and powerful. And my favorite way of showing what it is, because everyone's head just goes to reuse content everywhere, mind it as well. I want to show you an example from the music industry where there's the same four chords are used to make up dozens and dozens and dozens of pop music hits. So take a look. This is an awesome, I'm just going to play a 30 second clip of it, but it is a video from Access of Awesome. Yes, Laura, I totally got them. Where they're showing how the same four chords are a part of a ton, a ton of different songs. So take a quick listen. Just listen. Do you recognize this? Uh, yeah, that is Don't Stop Believing by Journey. Great song. Very original There's a few more song. Fit. Check it out. My life is brilliant. My love is pure. I saw an angel of that I'm sure. Well, that's just two songs that are similar. That's Forever not young. I want to be forever young I won't hesitate no more, no more It cannot wait, I'm yours This is the way you left me I'm not pretending No love, no hope, no glory No happy ending Cause you Okay, so the first time I watched this video, it blew my mind, absolutely. And every time I watched it again, oh, really, Laura, they did an updated version. I'm going to have to go and check it out. So this is what I mean to say. Our goal is to take one idea and look at how we can create dozens of fresh, completely different sounding hits with one same idea. So here is your challenge. We are nearly in December. We've got one month left, or barely a month because we've got the holidays. Go back and look at everything that you did in, from January 1st and go and look for your top four or five hits, the, the content that really resonated with your audience. What we're going to do is we're going to take those ideas and spin them and create multiple different hit versions of it that can apply to different people, different stages of the funnel, different angles. And so so you're not going to create any more new content because good God, that takes so much work and effort. And at least for me, like tears almost every time. Like, why did I do this? Why did I get myself into this? Uh, and then it's great. So think of any one, two, three, four, five pieces and let's work on those. And maybe some will work at different places. So we'll break them down. And for each of these, I'm going to share what the normal best practice is. And then I'll give you a tip for how you can pick it up a notch and we'll get better. So yeah, James, the struggle is completely real. The first one is taking the same concept and applying it for different people, right? We know why that works as different audience segments influence the purchase decision in different ways. They're also influenced in different ways. And so what most people end up doing is that, hey, let's take one idea and apply it for different audiences, whether they are 
demographic, psychographic, regional, or so on. And we'll tend to see, you know, really good examples of stuff that's always there. Um, you know, stuff like Fidelity, which is an investment company. They're trying to give people information about retirement planning. So of course they wouldn't give the same information to somebody in their 20s and 30s versus somebody who's in their 50s, right? It's a completely different stage of life. And so they took the same idea and you can see on the right, uh, the left side of the screen will be for the 20s and the 30s where they're just giving people different ideas for what they can do to save up for retirement. Same advice, just tailored for somebody's different a uh, life stage, that's simple. Or, you know, we see great examples like Mintel, they took one research report, one design concept, applied the same thing to different industries. Makes sense. Or oh, I love this idea and I love that it's a marketing meetup. Uh, this is so meta because it's a marketing meetup example as well, but it's one of my favorite videos that's on their TikTok. So I'm going to just play it, uh, just a little clip of it as well. This is a McDonald's ad. <laughs> so let's take a look at this quick example to see. So I'm like, all right. An interesting example of localizing adverts by McDonald's. <laughs> it just goes to show that one idea can work so well for different audiences. But why stop there, right? That most people are already doing that. Hopefully all of you are doing this as well, where you're creating your ideas and you're tailoring them for a different audiences. But what you can do to kick it up a notch is to have different people share the same idea. Now let's put that into context. Have you ever followed Apple's annual product launches? They've been the same since the time of Steve Jobs, um, where it, it follows the same formula, where the CEO will always make this big announcement featuring inspirational storytelling around the company's big vision, why they created the products, and he'll highlight some of the key benefits. Then they'll go in and bring in different product experts, the one who built the products, to talk about those products and greater detail, right? Each comes at it from their area of expertise, from their angle. They've even brought in celebrities in the past, such as Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon. Um, then, of course, they have the brand page itself. Uh, Apple's website will share all of this info. And, and then they also have typical end users and product review experts come in as well and speak and promote, uh, present about their new products. All of these people are talking about essentially the same thing, but they're all coming at it from their own unique vantage points and their own areas of expertise. And what happens is, is reporters tend to cover it all. It all gets picked up and all of us end up devouring everything. We're like, yeah, yeah we watched it live. Then we read the sort of CNET coverage. Then we read this uh, sort of what social media is buzzing about. And we can apply the same thing. It's one of the most important trends that I'm seeing, especially on social media, is this rise of people focusing on thought leadership content. And it helps to look at it um, as to why this is happening so much right now. Well, one, you may have noticed that sales cycles have been getting longer, especially if you're in B2B. And you may have also noticed that some of your bottom funnel content is maybe just not performing as much. Edelman research, in fact, showed that 64% of C-suite executives say their companies have already begun tightening their procurement processes. And 44% and of decision makers claim they're less receptive to sales calls or marketing outreach. So it's just making it harder and harder, right? We can go out there and push for the same bottom funnel, but we're going to start to see dwindling returns. But what do we do? How do we go out there and still keep ourselves top of mind to still keep engaging and nurturing our audiences? That's where bringing in thought leadership content, like bringing in your people is super, super important. Um, why? Because people relate to people, right? People engage with people, people buy from people. And when you're looking to 
engage with your audiences, find their peer sets, right? You want people who engage with their peers. What it does is it just helps you amplify the conversation. Let's look at this example from SEMrush. They recently, a couple of weeks ago, announced a brand new launch. They put out a really cool post where they had this post that was a fun, humorous image that talked about what well, life is in SEO. And then they talked about their new feature. It got a ton of great engagement reactions, comments too. But then at the same time, Olga Andrienko, who is their VP of brand marketing, went out there and published a, a post about the launch, but coming at it from her angle. And she talked about it, about why she's so excited about it. What are some of the features she's seen that Samrush has already had? What's up, something new that's coming up? And it was a different approach. And the result of that was she got a ton and ton of comments on her post in addition to just likes and reactions. And those comments help spark dialogue and help give it a lot more reach and engagement. Because every time if you like or comment on one of my posts, then my post is going to show up to your audience, right? That's just how those algos work. Do that. You can keep having the brand voice talking about it but it would never reach as many people as if you had multiple people from the company share it. Um, or another really, really great example is, is Rand. I had to put him in because he's on the marketing meetup for uh, the Philadelphia event next week. Um, he'll so well known for his whiteboard Friday approaches. So he'll host them on YouTube, but then he'll share clips of them as well across social media. It helps keep Spark Tour in the news without always being like, check out this new release from my company or always coming from the company voice. And it doesn't always have to be your executive either, right? Like Duda is a company where they host webinars with industry experts too. So don't always feel like it's all in the hands of your CEO or your C-suite. In fact, if you're thinking about whose voices you should amplify, I always recommend starting with salespeople first. Why? Because it helps connect to the bottom line. Like, think about this. If you were going to get a random email from Joe Schmo salesperson, you're probably going to be less likely to want to open it or engage or reply. But if you got an email or a message or a call from somebody you had been following and had gotten some value from, now you'd be much more inclined to take that call or reply to that email. So it just increases the odds there. So start with sales reps if your C-suite is too busy or I don't have the time. Another great one is to think about who your end audience is. If your end audience is very technical, um, then have your technical subject matter experts in your company go out and speak because people will respond best to their peers. Um, yeah, customer facing people, Rebecca, it's exactly build that familiarity, build that bond, um, build the rapport in their minds, right, with your company, because people will start to associate the people with the brand a lot more. And then you'll think differently about a brand if you like some of the people uh, that end up working there, too. So remember, you don't just have to repurpose one idea for different people, but what you can do it is repurpose it from different people. So if you go back and look at one of your big hits, who else can talk about it? Who else can come across it and make it feel personal, relevant? Uh, and by the way, weave thought leadership into your overall content strategy. You don't need a separate strategy for that. Okay, so the first one we talked about who people are, let's go to where people are at in their buying journey, right? How you best practice says, which we will then elevate, but best practice says that how you position your content should vary based on your audience's level of awareness, interest, and intent. If you were trying to explain what you did to uh, what you did for a living to your five-year-old niece or nephew versus a fellow marketer, would you explain it in the same way? Probably not, right? You'd need different contexts. Yep. Nope, Josh, exactly. And, you know, the context needed would be different for each and what would interest them would also be different. So you'd have to have a different answer. And in the same way, you want to 
tailor your content to where the audience is at. And everyone immediately goes and thinks about the funnel. Oh, I've got to create content for each stage of the funnel and then make that work. But then we'll get into internal debates. Now, I don't know if this really happens with you, but it happens to me all the time when I'm talking to the coworkers or clients or somebody we're sitting with. And they're like, wait, is this mid funnel content? Is this upper funnel? Uh, is this bottom funnel? Like, where should this go? How much percentage do I have? Um, and it is so debatable. And that's also because the funnel is a sort of marketing construct. It's not really, um, no one really follows the funnel to the T. And so I found that a better way of thinking about it is, is to go with the five levels of awareness, which is a concept that Eugene Schwartz had created in his 1966 book, Breakthrough Advertising. And I absolutely love it. And it's, yes, it's all about advertising, but we can completely steal it and apply it to content marketing. And he says that there's generally five stages of awareness. So let's break them down and I'll give you a potential example. So let he says that the first stage is where people are completely unaware. They don't know that they have a problem or they just don't know that there's ways that they could optimize their present reality. And so content for them would need to focus on making them aware of the problem and remind them why they don't wanna ignore it. So think more top funnel. Um, let's look at an example. Let's say that you know we're trying to talk AI. AI is everyone's buzzword right now, right? We wanna talk about it. So independent sector makes it super relevant by saying that, hey, artificial intelligence, why the nonprofit sector should pay attention. Now, I love this because they're tailoring it for a specific audience, right? They're saying, hey, nonprofit people. But now in doing that, they dialed up the relevancy. So if I worked in nonprofit, then maybe I'd be more inclined to read this article. Um, Alex, they don't have time to schedule in LinkedIn into their day job. I know, I know. I have some tips for that. We can talk about that at the end for sure. And I'll share with you a little bit of what I do too. So the next stage is problem aware. So maybe they know that they have a problem, but they don't know yet if or how to solve them uh, or to solve that problem. So with here, you want to think about digging into their pain points and showing that you understand and empathize with them. But you also want to give them some hope and empowerment that look that there are things you can do to solve it, right? If I'm just sitting there thinking like, oh my God, robots are coming for the job, for my job, we're done, what's going on? Think about an article like this. So Bilton is saying that, hey, they're leaning in on people worrying about AI taking over jobs. But now they're also digging deeper and showing that there's hope as well, that look, it's going to eliminate jobs, but it's also gonna create jobs. Here's what you need to know about the future of it. And so now it's drawing people in and meeting them where they're at. Let's go down to the next stage, which is solution aware. So now they know, okay, they know they have a problem. They know solutions exist, but they just may not know who you are as a company or that you might be a valuable uh, contender for them to consider for purchase. So what you need to do here is think about more educational content or brand awareness content to show how you can be a solution, but you also don't wanna be seen hitting them over the head with sort of buy now or case study. They're probably not even ready for a case study yet. They're still wanting to know more. Take this human interest approach. I love this. This is from Microsoft, my former employer, where they're sharing this human interest story about here are our product managers who built these AI products that we're um, selling. And let's learn from these people who built the AI, how they're using it to boost creativity, learn new skills, and find joy in what they do. It's not a hard sell. They're educating people, they're opening their eyes to possibilities, and they're getting in some brand recognition in there too. Now they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's so good. Even their own people use it. And I didn't know you could use this to do that. Getting warmer, getting warmer, the leads are getting warmer with your product aware. So now they're aware of the solution, but now they're also aware of your competitors. 
maybe they're not quite ready to choose, but maybe they have a short list of, you know, five, 10 people. You want to still get their top of mind for why you would be the right choice. Um, so you're not quite bottom, bottom of the funnel, but you're more mid to the lower. That's where your thought leadership content can come in. You see how we have different people. This is my friend Donna Sarkar, where she's talking about um, co-pilot, different uses, how to set it up. It seems like it's super friendly, warm, helpful content, right? It doesn't come across as hitting you over the head salesy, but she's just like, hey, if you're using this co-pilot, if we look at the one on the left, She's like, here's where you go to find it. She's just empowering people. And then everyone can follow her to hear about cool stuff. And it's not salesy. And now finally, then the fifth stage where they're the most aware, they're close to choosing you, but they haven't yet. So here's your absolute bottom funnel. You need to be a little more promotional, but think about what could be some of their potential objections that they could have. Here's where social proof can do really, really well. Uh, this is an example from Jasper, which is the AI content writing tool where they're just sharing a case study about one of their customers who grew traffic 166% in two months using their service. So what if they, what do you all feel? Wasn't this a more helpful way of looking at it, which is those five stages of awareness? Like for me, it completely changed how I think about content and how I'm, meeting our audiences where they are, right? People might have different levels of awareness, different levels of interest, but I need to meet all of them where they're at. And it would be so simple if you could challenge yourself to take one piece of super hit content that worked for you this year and said, you know, what could be different levels of awareness that I could tailor it to? Exactly, Josh, it's all about the distribution is just take that content Take what's worked, see if you can reach additional people in your audience who may not have been interested. For example, if I wasn't in the market or I didn't think at all I needed a tool like Jasper, then even if I saw that very compelling case study, I would probably just scroll past it because I didn't think I need it. But if I had seen an article that said that, you know, here's why even content creators should not be sleeping on these, you know, just of content AI companies that maybe I'd be more likely to want to read on and, and then going down there. Okay. Now we know who and whom is creating the content, what we're trying to reach, who's talking about it. We know how we're going to reach them at different stages of awareness. Now we want to think about the best ways to get the message across. So that's where it comes to different angles. Why is this important? Well, let me ask you another question. How many aspiring musicians do you think dream about becoming a one-hit wonder? Probably zero. Exactly. Thank you, Romina, uh, Jessica. Exactly. Zero. Right? No one. Right? We, if I was to become a musician, we'd all want multi I'd want to have multiple hits. And that's really what high impact content is also like. Your content content calendars should be vibrant and diverse. It should be like a playlist of hit songs from your favorite brands and bands that can appeal to various moods, right? If I am, I know I need to clean my room and I don't feel like doing it, I'm going to need that peppy song. If I've had that really crappy day at work, but I need to motivate myself, I've got the different music, right? You want to have your content, like music, ignite multiple motivations and handle different objections. And so this is such a good way of coming at one idea from different angles. So let's look at the normal popular best practice that we've done and that we have learned to do, right? Probably the first thing we learned in marketing is to speak to people's buying motivations. Good salespeople know that they're going to lean into one or more of these to close the sale, right? Whether to appeal to people's desire to gain or profit or people's fear of pain or to avoid losing something. We know these six. We use them well, consciously, subconsciously. It becomes so ingrained. But where I find that not enough people are paying attention 
is to overcome the most common objections. Now, I know it can feel like that there could be dozens and dozens and dozens of objections. You'll be like, well, how will I ever, ever overcome all of them? What research has found time and time again is that there tend to be at the root four core objections. And most objections will always boil down to one of these four. And so if you can proactively adjust this with some of your content, then you can give yourself a little bit of a, an advantage. So for example, prioritization, people just may not feel like they've got the time to fit you in. So to that point earlier in the comment that said that, you know, I know LinkedIn, posting on LinkedIn is super important, but there's just no time for that, right? They just don't feel it's valuable or worth it enough to make it their priority. And so to handle this, you've got to overcome by showing how your offering is going to help save them time or make them money, right? You've got to show that carrot at the end and like dangle it in in their faces that did you know that you know if you post consistently on LinkedIn for 90 days you can see this like massive growth in following and in brand recognition and names and leads and everything and you can show them case studies that will help incentivize them to be like oh maybe I should make it a priority and so if you were going on and on about how like we won all these awards. We're the best brand ever where you're trying to showcase that you're brand authority. But the objection was all about like, I just don't think it's valuable enough to fit it in my day to day. You'd have the mismatch, right? Because you'd be like, we're amazing. We won. Look at the awards we won. And they're like, we don't care about the awards you won. We just don't have the time. So that's where you want to speak to it. The next one is really all about value. Like, okay, maybe we've got the time for it, but is it really going to be worth is it going to be worth it? Is it expensive? Like, yes, you know, it's good, but what's the value exchange? Is it there? And again, here's, you've got to show them how it will help them avoid risk or why they can't be sleeping on it. It's like, here's the value of paying attention to AI right now. Oh, it's perception. Maybe you can bang on and on and on about how you'll save them so much time and make them lots of money. But if they're like, I don't know who you are, like you're Joe Schmo salesperson. I've never heard of you before or you don't have a reputation, here's again where trust and social proof can come in and that's a good angle to take. And then the fourth one is really, are you talking to the right person? You could come to me all the time and being like, hey, do you want to buy this? I'm like, I actually am I'm not on the procurement team of that solution. So you can market to me all you want, but make sure you want to hit the right people. Now, how many of you are in B2B? Just hit Y or Y for yes. Uh, if you are B2B. Oh, okay. There's quite a few of you. Awesome. You know that B2B, oh, there's so many of you. I love this. Okay. Then let me pause extra. In B2B, we don't just tend to have one decision maker, right? The, your decision maker is not just the person who signs the contract. There's more and more people. Yes. B2B is so massive, Rebecca. Uh, there's usually what's almost commonly referred to as a buying committee, where there's people who influence the decision. There's people who are the end users of a product. You'll want to be creating content that appeals to these different people because all of them can help weigh in and influence the final decision uh, that the person who signed the contract will take. So are you creating content for different audiences, right? Are you creating it for the end user? Are you going to create it for the Sometimes the person who's just doing the research, do that. Think about who you're trying to influence, how they can be influenced uh, and come up with that. And then another thing that you can, that's really, really important, both from an angle point of view, but also an inclusion point of view, is to diversify your creative format. We all know different people absorb content in different ways, right? Some of us prefer audiobooks, some of us print books. Some prefer watching videos, others will be like, nope, I'll just read the transcript. Some people find subtitles distracting, some like me can concentrate and focus better if I can listen and have the closed captioning on the screen too. We're all different and that's okay, that's very normal. And sometimes it's also very situational, right? I may prefer to watch a video, but if I'm on public transport and I don't have my AirPods, 
I'm not going to be that person listening to it on full volume uh, in front of other people, right? Then I'll just probably want to read the transcript or something like that. So given that there's so many different ways that people process and assimilate information, it's going to be pretty hard to find a one size fits all option. And so having multiple content formats is the more inclusive thing to do because you can engage people the way they prefer to consume content, but you're also able to reach much more people and maybe people who couldn't consume your content before would actually be able to now, right? If I have a, a hearing condition, then if I can have subtitles on the video, then I'll be able to watch it and, and consume it as well. So the biggest thing to do is offer your content in many different formats and let your audience pick. Now, there is a benefit to us as well, the lazy people like me. We can have double the content or triple the content. I'll give you an actual example. So I posted, I post little videos on LinkedIn every Tuesday, and they're usually like three minutes or under, and I'll share different concepts or different little nuggets of info. Like it's little aha moments that I found valuable that I'm like, oh, let me share it with somebody else in case they find it valuable. So one of the posts I had was talking about content strategy and what needs to be in there. And it had quite a good amount of engagement and people seem to really like it. So I'm like, huh, that, that works. What if I just take some of the points from it and turn it into an image? And so then like, a few weeks later, I published pretty much the same content, but I just did it as a single image versus and like a little cheat sheet image that was then published. And it also tended to, it got, uh, I was getting a whole bunch of additional reactions too. And in that way, that repetition can be very, very helpful. I want to give you another example that I actually do at work at LinkedIn. So one of the things that I do is I build this customer like education, customer empowerment program. And so we create different webinars. And so let's say we recently did a webinar on ABM or account-based marketing. We know that you can go to the best webinar and get really, really excited. But then when you go back to your desk, it sometimes real life gets in the way and then you forget. And so I didn't want that to happen with people because I was answering a lot of the questions that they had asked. So I said, okay, at the end of the session, I first offered them a little planner. So I was like, hey, you've got all of this great ABM info. Now go in and here's a little planner so you can take the next step. Then a couple of weeks later, in case, because people may have been trying to implement it, I realized that one of my fellow marketing teams had created this ABM playbook. I'm like, huh, I can repurpose their awesome content and use it to add value for this audience in case they are trying to set up their ABM campaigns and they may not have it. And so what I did was there was repetition, there was content in, in different formats, but it all helped guide them, hold their hand, help them feel empowered and educated to set up a high impact ABM campaign. So it started with a webinar, they got a little planner or guide, and then a couple of weeks later, they got a little resource or uh, playbook that they could refer to. And overall, that just helped give value to them and help reuse a lot of the content and make it feel very holistic. So keep this in mind. You, know, you don't always have to be creating new, new, new content. You can be <clears throat> the same content that you've already have, that you've already proven to win. Take that, spin it like a DJ, and it'll be a lot more impactful and feel super fresh if it comes out in different angles and different formats and drive more impact. And so really, I would say, Think of your high value content assets as your as long term investments. Don't treat them disposably as you do with fast fashion. In fact, do what I call girl math, which is if you buy those really, really expensive pair of shoes, then you don't calculate the cost. If you calculate it by how much it costs per wear. So if I want to take that, whatever, let's say $300 pair of boots and if I wear them 30 times, then they only cost $10. That's girl math. So you want to think about your content assets and see how you can use them so many times in different ways, right? Especially if you have a big idea, make it work. 
And a really good way to tell that you're onto something, that you're onto a really good idea, is if you can think of many, many different uses for it. So get your content in front of your audience whenever, wherever that'll work, right? Create it for different segments and from from different people. Come at it from, uh, you know, meet them where they're at based on their level of interest and awareness. Come at it from different angles, overcome objections as well. And then you'll find that you just don't need as much content and a few pieces of content will help you create ton and ton of content, regardless of how stretched or not stretched your resources are. Oh yeah, Alex, that's also a good, if you don't buy the expensive bag, the shoes will be free. <laughs> I love it. We can talk girl math. Okay, so let me stop sharing my screen. You can always say hello, by the way. You can. I love talking content. I love nerding out. So hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter or Twix as where people are calling it now. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you. And let me stop sharing so we can chat through questions. Amazing. Thank you, Pona. That's it's so funny. You've just given uh every single person who's a bit of a shopaholic in the uh, in the chat permission to go out and spend an absolute fortune because perna said actually if i wear it more it's cheap <laughs> I know. my husband is not into my girl math he's like it doesn't it's, work that way i'm like but i yeah. won't have to buy boots for the next two years so doesn't it work out by year <laughs> that's so funny it's a really interesting uh interesting way of looking at things but um one of the things that um that I loved about it was a brilliant presentation and, and thank you. There's so much gold in there. Um, I've been furiously writing down as uh, as you were going through. Um, one thing that uh, people might find really useful is uh, Joe and I use uh, Shield Analytics, uh, which is a little Chrome uh, plugin which will give you some more detailed analytics on your LinkedIn posts throughout the year. So actually, if you're going to go back through and look at your most popular posts and I know a few people that do this they'll literally go and take the post and almost cut and paste it and and post it again obviously as, he, as your audience grows a lot of people won't have seen that piece of content it's a, an easy way of creating something that you know has already been uh, has already been done um, and John uh, in the chat was talking about um, well he called it ramifying but he spelt it wrong he meant gamifying uh, the sort of competition between teams I think that's a uh, that's a great idea. Um, it's just a case of uh, yeah, helping get it, getting people on board. Um, which which <laughs> so we prefer ramming. Okay, we'll call it ramify. Uh, let's see you sell that one into your sales team. Um, it's the uh, latest buzzword in marketing. Have you all not heard about yeah. ramifying? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I want to see lots of LinkedIn posts tomorrow about ramifying, and uh, we'll just confuse the LinkedIn community. It'd be brilliant. Um, <laughs> So uh, coming coming on to the Q&A, uh, interestingly, that, that ties in with the first question um, where uh, an anonymous person says, any tips on getting sales team buy-ins for, for sharing contents in their own words? Uh, we've got a big team of sales staff, but most are reluctant to do the, the social side. And I think that's probably probably quite a common common problem for, uh, for folks in the, in the chat. It is. And so I just tried to find some... Before I even pilot, I try to find a proof of concept. I find that some people are just much more open if there is one. So if by any chance, so let's say best case scenario, you have one or two salespeople who already are active. We can go and showcase, like, look at what they're doing. We can start with them, give them little tidbits, get them to post a little, see what happens. Um, that would be a best case. And then you can say that, look, this is they're seeing this, they're seeing a better response rate. Um, you know, they're hearing more and more about people referring to some of their posts. That's the other interesting thing is sometimes you may not get as many reactions on a post, but people are still really, really consuming it. And you can go look at your analytics too for your post. So you can look at which companies are, I'm giving a very jumbled answer. I get very excited about this. So let me decaffeinate myself a little. Uh, so one, I'm going to let's break it into steps. So step one, is try to see you can start with somebody who is already active if they are they'll be so much easier they'll be your proof of concept if you can't find if no one's active already try to find one who'll be like the more willing or easier to work with and keep them as your proof of concept right you surely you'll be able to find one person and then you can work with them and then you can be like oh well look what james is doing like james is working out so well like joe get with the program right and so sorry i'm just completely using james completely the other way around but yeah 
get your point. Um, <laughs> start with that. The second one is as they're posting, you can click into your post analytics on LinkedIn and you can see which companies and which role profiles are actually engaging with your content or having the most impressions with. So that's super important. So for example, I'm creating content that I want to make sure that other marketers are consuming. So I'll look at like job titles and this is free. It's open to anyone. You don't need to have a paid subscription to do it. Um, so look in there, who's got, who's looking at it from which company. And in that same way, you can have your salesperson to be like, look, you were trying to reach XYZ Inc. You're getting more people from XYZ Inc. looking, that's true. Then the third one is I would try to find a case study or so on um, to incentivize them to do it if you're still getting reluctance. And then the third thing is you don't have to post every single day. I find that's the one misconception that sometimes puts people off is that I don't have the time for it because I've got to post every single day. And you don't. You don't. And I know it's really strange for me as like this person who works at a social media to be like, you don't have to post every day, but really you don't. What you have to do is be consistent with your thing. And so even once or twice a week can be really, really important. And so some things that I personally do is I'll try to like batch and record a bunch of videos on one day because God knows I'm not putting on makeup like once a week, every single week, right? I mean, unless I have to, right? I'll bash them once, I'll edit them off and I'll put them on, you know, try to be, you'll find efficiencies. You as the marketer can almost give them seed content uh, as well to make their life easier. But once you get some person doing it, you start to notice people calling it out, it will work out. So anyway, that was my very long answer, but yeah, just no, that's, that's great. One person go out and do it, and then everyone else will want to follow and jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, and I think those that are maybe short on, like, if you've managed to get people to post a couple of times that are maybe short on ideas, this uh, we were at a talk with Mark Ritson um, a, a couple of months ago, and he was talking about, I'm pretty sure it was Mark Ritson, the, uh, the idea that Kit Kat's adverts haven't changed in like 30 years. It's it, it's essentially the same thing, you know. Take a break, have a Kit Kat, or have a break, have a Kit Kat, even. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we get bored of our own content quite easily. Yes. I get bored of talking about the same things, and I think, oh, my audience are going to be really bored of that. But actually, they probably haven't even seen it. Um, there's so, there's such a small amount of people that see and remember what you've said that that actually you can repeat yourself quite quite a lot, and you know that way that repetition actually makes you an authority as well so um so yeah i think it, it does that's an excellent point james and i'm gonna say that like another mistake i see marketers make is sometimes we'll post a piece of content it doesn't get the reaction we were hoping for and then we'll just give up on it so we give up on content too soon maybe it was the wrong time the wrong format the wrong platform maybe put it somewhere else try it again um and i think because not everyone sees it or not maybe everyone would be receptive to it when you first time post it it's really it's really important so there's there's me joe and one of the chap uh, that have a little whatsapp group called linkedin therapy and it's because we get we go through these stages of feeling really disheartened by statistics or you think oh i've, I've got this this brilliant idea for a post and it bombs and then you'll write one about you know something that just doesn't you know doesn't have any sustenance to it and it does really well and you're like oh this is so demoralizing but actually we kind of lift each other up and it, it's like it's cool it's just part of the process it happens you know don't don't take those engagement metrics to heart mm -hmm. too much because you know anecdotally the it'll be somebody that you'll bump into at a meet that'll be like oh i love that that video you yeah. shared that post and you think hang on that was the one that did really badly and but, but it, it's got to the person you wanted it to so um so yeah it's uh it's a hard one to sort of keep keep mentally strong um We've got we've got a question here uh, about AI. Um, do you use any specific AI tools to review your already successful content to identify key topics um, that you could reuse and repurpose content uh, into other posts slash uses? So I guess it's a, a question around uh, AI tools to support the, your efforts. Do you use any? Oh, so that's such a good idea. So I'm going to answer this with my personal hat on and not my company hat on. But um, one, I don't use any AI tools to go back and analyze, like for me, I still do it a little bit manually because I'm mainly active on like three or four platforms the most, but not to say that you aren't, but that's a great use case for it. What I will sometimes do is that, hey, you can take 
you know, a long video and I can put it into a, you know, like a chat GPT and be like summarize this or, you know, make it a little bit more succinct, things like that, or, you know, help me come up with two or three like bites from it there. So those could be really cool. I've talked to some folks who are using, uh, there's an, I forget the name of the tool, but there's a video tool that will just take a long form video and slice it up into like two or three minute bite size ones. That could be good, but usually like I'm, I still create all my content like really like by hand or like I'll type it all up and then I'll I'll know what I want to do but then I'll use AI tools to help me create it so I will use AI tools for closed captioning for example that makes it so much easier I'll use it for little filters and so on um, and yeah there's many many amongst you you're absolutely right there's so many different AI vid tools that can do that in fact there's more tools that I'm able to keep up with uh, so if you have recos like hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Yeah, even, and I'll share. Even. But for me, I create all my videos on my phone. Then I'll use a like CapCut as the editing tool, which is free. And I'll put it all on there, and then I'll do the closed captioning too. And then I'll put it all on. And so it really is so low cost, such little time as well. Yeah, pretty much all the uh, I edit a lot of video, and all of the tools now have AI built into them. So things like uh, the Adobe Pro, you know, Adobe Premiere, that's there's things that save you so much time and will clip things vertically and automatically reframe. And, you know, it's, uh, it's clever stuff out there. So, um, so yeah, we've got, um, we've got a question from Simon saying, uh, writing great content is one thing, but I'm wondering on uh, any hints you have about getting the content significantly noticed for SMEs, micro businesses who may not have the budgets for, for paid. Um, so that's when your organic social can do really, really um, well. It's okay if you don't have the budget for paid. In fact, so many times we'll say start organic mm -hmm. and prove out what works. And if you've seen something that is particularly resonating well with your ideal audience, then maybe you can chuck a few bucks at it. Like sometimes even a very teeny tiny ad spend can help it reach a total address you know your reach out to more of your addressable market because you know like marketing will only reach out to the people who already know you and know who you are so do that other things you can do is tag other influencers in the space you can comment on other people's posts that will just help give visibility and bring people back to you and your content and you know leverage the power of social put it up on youtube put the social back in social media. So, you know, even if it's on YouTube, which is not technically a social media channel, but you can go in and comment on other creators, have other creators comment on you, be a part of communities such as the marketing meetup, right? Talk to fellow marketers, get them to sort of lean in, give, you know, weigh in on stuff, find out who you're audiences where they hang out spark toro rants tool is really really helpful for that to see like if you're trying to hit a certain type of audience where do they hang out what type of content do they click on do they engage with it all starts with understanding who your audience is like what they care about what would be valuable for them how they use different platforms because again not all people use the platform the way it is conventionally designed right you can think tiktok and you can think tiktok is mainly just for the super young or gen z type if you believe in generational labels but there's this whole other market like some of my favorite content to follow is grandmoms from different parts of the world sharing their traditional recipes i'm like i love this i follow an italian grandmom i follow an indian grandmom i read i, I that type of content i love it because it's like heritage recipes but and ai tools and tiktok have reduced that barrier to entry and more people will create content so just think about it that um how your audience uses a platform or the type of content they react to may not be what everyone reacts to yeah absolutely and i and i know from you know from the sort of growth that joe has had over the years on on the platform i think he's at like something like sixty five thousand followers and and even myself who started 18 months ago trying to post regularly it just takes time to to mm -hmm. build an audience and and it's so small the growth is that you you there's so many times you go oh this is no point but then you look back and you're like oh oh actually my my audience is quite a bit bigger than it was and you know, and it grows quicker the, the bigger it gets as well, which is which is interesting. But um, Nick uh, Elliott says, uh, how do you know when you have worked your assets off too much? When is enough enough? We, we might be going back to the Kit Kat answer here, but um, but do you, do you think there is a point at which you can 
you know, flog a dead horse? <laughs> Sometimes, but I, I think I'm in the camp of repetition really does help. And actually the science behind it. So what Mark Ritson says, it's if you think about the Ebbinghaus uh, curve of forgetting, so there's actually a full um, study behind it. It shows that the first time you're exposed to information, you forget like 90% plus of it. With every subsequent review of that, re-review of that content, you remember more and more of it. So yeah, but again, people have the choice, right? Ignoring content takes no effort. If you start to see like dwindling returns and people just no longer engaging with it, maybe it's time to retire it for a little while, but it doesn't have to be forever. Just come at it at a different angle. So no, there's no such thing as too much repetition until Plus you're just doing the same thing, you know, a hundred times a day, targeting ads to the same people everywhere. Then that can get a little excessive for sure. Yeah, definitely. There's there's one here that that's that's fairly new in the in the chat, but I think it's something that people quite often want to know. And I, I know we get asked a fair bit is um, is it best to ask staff to share the brand post on LinkedIn and add their own thoughts to the shared post, or use the content from the brand post to rewrite as their own post? that makes sense so basically do you reshare the company post and put a comment on it or do you take the concept and and turn it into their own well both work ideally you can have it take the concept and put it in your own words because that's more authentic it comes at it with your own perspective but you don't have to feel pressured if that's gonna uh you know dissuade you from posting then what you want can do is reshare it but make sure you add your perspective to it like why are you resharing it just a simple reshare with nothing added to it is not going to do that well it just generally doesn't get as much reach but if you can put in two or three sentences or a paragraph about you know here's what really stood out to me or here's why i really can add a little bit again the algo will probably respect that a lot more so uh, in fact, it's not just me saying that. And there's an entrepreneur article where LinkedIn's editor in chief, Dan Roth, talked a lot about the algo and what works. And he said, like, one of the things that's important is what's your perspective on this? And adding that is very helpful. That's right. And Deb, that's totally right, right? The average age of TikTok users is, is getting <laughs> older. We do see that. That's amazing. Thank, thank you, Perna. There's there's just two more things that I, I want to add before we uh, we close out the session. For those... Uh, that have uh, got all the way to the end. Uh, well done, you guys. Um, I know that um, I was chatting with Perna beforehand. She's got an amazing book that is out and we're going to send you uh, in the follow-up email a link to that book uh, with a little code in there if we can squeeze in the Black Friday deal if, you, if you're quick. Um, but also just to, to say next week, we have uh, Wendy Melville, uh, who's going to be talking about finding your marketing focus. Uh, a guide to strategic direction and uh, having chatted with her she's talking about how you can manage your boss as well how you can manage their focus which I think would be really useful for a lot of us um, so I'm really appreciative for the hundreds and hundreds of people that have come along today and thank you so much for uh, for coming in and, and making the chat so positive Perna amazing as always you're an absolute legend and um, and thank you so much for uh, for everybody for putting in the time to to be here and we'll um We'll see you next week. Thank you all so much. What a special community. And thanks for having me. Bye. See you guys.